<laughs> All right, we're going to have a lot of time for slides. <laughs> Let me show you what this would have done. <clears throat> I'm just going to Google Grouper Installer. So, I don't know what version this is, but this is what um, the output that you saw from the installer when this wiki was created. Um, basically, it's going to download the... Um, so, one of the points of the installer is to get you up and running quickly. One of the points is to show you every single command that the installer is running to make it work. And so, if you review everything that this does, it talks about which config files it edits, how it runs the builds, and everything like that. You can learn how to do a download and build a grouper just from the output of this thing. So basically it downloads grouper API um, 2.02 and this is the URL it gets it from. Then it unzips it, the, the gzip, then it undoes the tar. And then um, you can decide what, what database you want to use. So grouper, um, if you don't have anything else to use, it has HSQL, which is a um, uh, basically a Java jar that'll have a JDBC database. You don't want to use that for production. Um, if you have Oracle, MySQL, or Postgres, that's best. Um, it's possible it might work with uh, SQL Server. Uh, your mileage may vary. Um, you'll have a better experience with the other three. Um, but basically, if you had another database there and could create a schema, the installer will help you do that. So we're just going to use the default one. Um, these are the um, things it's going to set in the uh, uh, grouper.hibernate.properties. All you need to do is have a URL. And if you look at that file, <coughs> um, before 2.2, there was an example properties file and a regular properties file for all the properties files in Grouper. It's changing a little bit in 2.2 because there are overlays. Um, but basically, in 2.2 is not out yet. So right now I'll look at the Grouper Hibernate example properties and basically everything above this section is what you need to edit. And here are examples of URLs for each of the um, database types. So you would put that URL in here, you put a username, you put a password, and it's possible that the password could be encrypted in an external file um, for production. And then based on this URL it's going to detect what type of database it is and fill out some of this other stuff in the bottom for you. Or if you want to fill this out, if it doesn't do it right, you want to be more specific, you can do that. Like the Hibernate dialect, the uh, driver, um, I think that's pretty much all you need. So then, Question. yeah? Question. Uh, I forget, what is the database used for exactly? What kind of stuff goes into it? In Grouper? Yeah. Uh, your list of groups, your memberships, the attributes, assignments, permissions, basically everything in the registry that's stored in Grouper is stored in the database. Um, so it'll start HSQL because we're going down the HSQL road. Um, it's going to do a status to make sure it can connect to it. And then this init the database is, uh, um, it needs to create all the tables and views and everything that Grouper needs. So you're going to click, you're going to type T for true, and this is the command that it runs. GSH, and it's not bad for Windows or just GSH for um, uh, Unix or Linux or whatever. Dash registry. Um, dash drop will delete tables that are already there. Run script will run the script for you. If you don't have run script, it'll just print out the DDL and you can run that manually. And then no prompt. Normally Grouper will say, are you sure you want to do this to this database? This is the database you're connecting to because maybe you just changed your laptop to prod to fix a problem and now you're running this and then you delete all of prod, which has happened a couple times. Um, so now it's going to say, you're connecting to this database, are you sure? If you have no prompt, then it won't prompt you. So that'll help for things like the installer. Normally, you wouldn't put no problem on there. So then it will, um, and this this registry option for GSH is, is for upgrades too. It actually stores in the database what version of the DDL it's on and what version it should be, and then it runs the diffs to try to get up to there. And also, it, it's sophisticated enough to, uh, if you do a dash deep, if you dropped a column from a table, it would add just that column back for you. Um, something like that. It's supposed to do that. It's uh, Jakarta DDL utils. So this is the script that it created, and it's going to run that script, and now everything is, uh, all your tables and everything in views 
are created. Um, then Grouper has QS, Quick Start, um, Subjects and Data. And this was created a while ago, so it doesn't have a lot of the new attribute framework or permission stuff. But basically, this is a list of a couple hundred um, subjects that can be put in the local data store. Um, if you haven't created a, a subject source for your institution yet, and it's going to run that, and then um, after it does that, there's a quick start XML from the um, that it'll download and run, and that's going to create a bunch of uh, folders, groups, memberships, and so forth. Um, so let's see here. So that'll run the import for that script. Then we get to the UI. It downloads the UI. It um, expands it. It copies the build file from the um, template to the real one. It edits two properties. It tells it where grouper is. And this other one, which I don't know why it's the default. Maybe it isn't anymore. It's a uh, J2EE thing. Don't need to worry about it. In order to build the UI, you need ant, so it'll act, the installer will actually download an ant and expand that, and then it can use it. So to use the installer, you don't need ant or Tomcat, it'll download it for you. Now there's, the problem with ant, uh, at least when the last time I installed it, is the current, I think the 213 version I last built, it has a dependency on something called ant no depths, and if you don't have that installed with your ant, the build, the file's going to fail. So I had to do a yum install on ant no depths, whatever that means. Oh. But you might just want to make note of that. It's a minor problem. We'll figure it out when the build crashes. But um, what, what platform? So on Red Hat six, I believe. Red Hat five. Red Hat five. So you didn't use the installer version of ant. You had your own version. No. Uh, whatever I just, this did. I just did From the installer. installer? Yes. Yeah. There may have already been an ant on my box. I don't know if the installer recognized that or missed that. I have no idea. But it was a, it was a minor issue I ran into. Yeah, th this should use absolute path. So even if you had ant in your path, it should use the one. That's what I thought, yeah. I don't know. I, I can look into it, though. Okay. Or at least document it. Probably just document it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then it'll run ant disks in the UI, and it tells you what directory it's going from. So that'll basically use the API that it already downloaded, the UI, put them all together into one web app, and then it downloads the Tomcat that's there, um, expands that, runs the startup script to start Tomcat, uh, sees that it's listening on port 8080. Hey, seriously? And, um, password part. So, um, it's going to ask you what ports you want Tomcat to run on if the default isn't okay. So here it says it's going to be 8080. The shutdown and JK port are going to be 8009, 8005. You can set that to something else if you want or leave it. And then it says it edits the server XML to change those ports. And then it says, enter the Gooper system password. I need to stop double clicking. And um, when you set up authentication with the UI, by default, you can just use tomcat-users.xml. So this is just going to edit that file and make a role called Grouper user and a username and password in the um, tomcat-users. Um, then it's going to start Tomcat, again, wait for the port, then it's going to download the web service, and it's going to expand that, and it's going to edit the build properties to set the grouper directory to wherever the installer um, expanded that. Then it's going to build the web services. Um, then um, you can customize what you want your URL to be, the web services. In this case, the default is grouper-ws. Um, then it's going to tell Tomcat where that WAR file is. And it's going to stop Tomcat and start it again and make sure it's listening. And it's going to set the same grouper system password to the uh, 
uh, download the client, which is um, one Java jar that connects to web services, and it has a config file, and it's going to set the URL to whatever you configured it before. It's going to set the password and the username to whatever you specified before. And um, then in order for, um, let's see, in order to connect to web services by default, there's a group called Etsy Web Service Client Users. So this is going to create that group and add um, group or system to it so when the client runs, everything will work. And so it's just going to do uh, GSH is grouper shell, which is a um, bean shell implementation, Java bean shell implementation for grouper, where you get a, a um, shell and you can run commands. And so this is going to run a couple commands on that shell to um, create a session. create this group, add that user, and then the installer is actually going to run a, um, a uh, group or client command. And how you run that is similar to the installer, java-jar, group or client.jar. If you just type that in, it'll give you a list of commands you can run. In this case, dash dash operation equals get members. The group name is the web service client users. And the only thing that's returned is group or system, because that's the only member of the group at this point. And the last thing that's not in this document, um, it'll download the PSP as well and unzip that. And it doesn't really do a lot of configuration on that because it's hard to, to have a, a directory. We should use the Apache directory and, and have it work, but, but we don't have that at this point. So that's the installer. Any questions about that? Yeah? When you say PSP, what does that stand for? Provisioning Service Provider. That's the thing that goes from Grouper to an LDAP or AD or actually from an LDAP to. Lucy, did you cover the um, part? There was an option I'm thinking where you, you want to start the loader or not start the loader. And that's kind of a big deal because obviously you don't want two loaders running at once. You know, right. That can confuse you sometimes. At some point you may have to, yeah, go ahead and start the loader and then read some more documentation and start it again. So I don't think this is in this one. Ah, okay. Uh, <coughs> You know, I could, uh, I should have remoted to another server running from there. Um, so, yeah, the loader basically is um, um, the API GSH-loader. And there is something on the wiki that shows how to run it as a Unix service. But by default, it doesn't store a PID somewhere and make sure that that PID isn't already running or exists someone else owns it. So you can run it twice against the same database, and that's not good. Or maybe the loader should register itself in the database and know that another one's running. It's hard to tell if one has stopped. Um, but uh, yeah, you shouldn't, run it, you shouldn't run it twice for the same um, database. And it's also sort of hard to tell if it's running. You sort of have to do a PS command or look in the uh, task manager. and. Um, if you ran it in the background or um, um, you're going to have to um, just kill that process. So. What else? So uh, is the group client only available for Java? Is the group or client only available for Java? Yes. Um, I think people have implemented certain versions of the web services on different um, technologies, but we don't actively maintain that. The web services have a SOAP interface and a REST-like interface. And so if you have certain things you want to do from a programming language, you should be able to do it pretty easily just based on that. OK, so the next thing I was going to show, I actually just did, so I'll just show you what I did. Um, if you look at, if you Google grouper LDAP loader, I made a child page that says grouper loader LDAP example. And basically, I just Googled, I just Googled public anonymous 
LDAP users or something, and uh, CMU popped up. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, I CMU is now happy we didn't get 20 people to get the installer running real quick. So basically, all I knew was, oh. I think I'm still on your phone, should I go back to the non phone? Okay. List of public LDAP servers. BU used to be public, they're not anymore. Baylor used to be public, they're not anymore. CMU is still public. Um, yes, so I just went to, um, what's this thing called? LDAP administrator. Huh? Softera. Huh? Softera, yeah. LDAP administrator. And I just made a new connection to ldap.andrew.cmu.edu with no credentials or anything. And it basically told me that um, dccmu, dcedu connected, you know, whatever. And then I see there's ou equals person. And I click on one of these people. There's a GUID. And there's some other stuff, some object classes and so forth. So basically, um, you know, in the last 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever, I've been piecing together a um, subject source, which I put on the wiki, so you can see that here. So basically, the subject source, um, subject sources in Grouper can either go to um, SQL or LDAP. I have to turn that thing off. It's going to run out pretty soon. And um, I picked the LDAP one. I have this URL that says LDAP 389, LDAP.andrew.cdu. Uh, no authentication. I have um, GUID as the subject ID. And for subject ID, generally you want um, something that's not going to change. If it's opaque, that's fine. And GUID here is a UUID, GUID, that's a good um, subject ID. And then subject identifier, um, in this case, that one doesn't have one. Uh, I was just looking and it looks like this thing, CMU Andrew Common Namespace ID, JBAM, that looks like a, a, a net ID or something. So I'm just going to put that as the identifier. An identifier is something that can change for a person. It doesn't have to be opaque, um, but it'll just refer to that user. So that could be a mail account. It could be an EPPN. Probably not a mail account. It could be an EPPN. It could be your net ID, um, whatever. So, um, and expand, then. Can you expand, expand a little bit on the difference between subject ID and subject identifier? Can you tell from ID and identifier how well, different I, they are? It, it, it bounces <laughs> off my thick skull, and I have not been able to get my head around the subtle differences between what happens between subject identifier and subject ID. Okay. And what that really means. Or each, subject ha ha each subject has one ID. That's how Grouper refers to that subject. So it'd be nice if that never changed. It's not peppered around lots of tables, just in one table. It's just in the Grouper members table. Okay. Um, if you look at... If you look at the group members table, uh, Grouper makes a UUID for each subject. That's a foreign key. There's one subject ID and one subject source. That's how it refers to a user. So in this case, I called my subject source CMU directory. It has this UUID. Um, It'd be nice if that never changed for the person, because if in CMU in the directory, if they change their subject ID, whatever you're using for that, all of a sudden all their group's memberships permissions are gone because they're connecting as a different one, and all the ones they had were on the old one. 
So the subject ID ideally should be something that doesn't change for the person, and it's okay to be opaque, and it probably should be opaque. Um, at pen, we use pen ID, which is an eight-digit number. Um, subject identifier, uh, you can have multiple subject identifiers for a user. Um, again, they can change, it's okay. Um, so generally, those are going to be your net IDs, your EPPNs. Other things that you're going to be, that, that systems and the web services or UI or whatever are going to be looking up a specific user. So that, no two users should have the same subject identifier or ID. Um, but one subject can have multiple subject identifiers and they can change. Okay, that wasn't clear. That's good. That's, that's never stored, the identifier is never stored in Grouper. It's only in your subject search. Okay. The idea is, yeah. So, um, you can have multiple sources set up in your Right. So is it typical or atypical to have the same subject from different sources? Um, you should they have, have a different ID, but you should it have be the same person. Right? You should have one person to one subject, and if you have multiple sources with the same subject, you should massage that before you go to group room into one room. Okay. So your subject ID is your key. I mean, that's the big thing. Is that's the thing. That's it's your a key tuple. It's the subject ID and yeah. the subject source is the key. Oh, so your subject ID doesn't have to be. You can have you can have two sources that have different subject IDs that have two entries with different subject IDs. I don't recommend it because a lot of times you look up just by the subject ID right. and it'll go to every source and look for one. And if two sources have that one, you'll get an error. So you should have you should have subject ID being the key. Yes, you should, but you don't have to. If all your web services calls to Grouper look people up by the tuple of subject source and subject ID, then it's okay. You could have sources that don't do that. But a lot of a lot of systems don't do that. They get a net ID that comes in to their app, and then they go to Grouper and say, for this net ID, give me the groups under this folder. And if that net ID by subject identifier resolves across multiple sources, they're going to get an error back. Because on a practical basis, most people do usually just use one subject ID to multiple sources. What do you mean? Um, well, in our LDAP and our ID, I mean, our subject ID is just their identifier. But you don't use LDAP and AD as subject sources for group or do you? No, you're, so you're saying in that case you should never use multiple subject sources. You should have a single subject source. Subject source is how Grouper refers to people in your institution or things or whatever. You can provision to multiple places, right? And that's fine. They can have different IDs or whatever. You're saying they work, multiple but sources it, should not have the same subject ID. If you configure it in the sources XML, and you have multiple sources, you should probably have one subject per person, don't have a don't have a person that's in multiple sources. Right. And across your sources you shouldn't have the same subject ID. Yeah. So, so, for, so for instance we have we have a person subject source at Penn. We have a subject source for external people. We have a subject source for Kerberos principles that are apps that use our web services. The subject ID for the people is an eight digit number. The subject ID for external people is their EPPN, which is never an eight digit number. The subject source for that Kerberos. What Kerberos, mean? that's going to be their uh, Kerberos service principle, which is not going to be an EPPN or an eight digit number. But that's their subject ID. That's not just their identifier. That's their real subject ID for that that's source. That's the subject ID for that source. Right. So I, yeah, I guess I'm a little confused. I would think about the subject ID as being like the eight digit identifier, and then your all your identifiers being like your Kerberos principle, your EPPN, your mail address. So I, I just so I think that so so maybe maybe another way to, way to say the say the same thing is that although the subject API can be configured with multiple multiple sources, 